This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The subject is dark matter. Is it real? What is it? And how does it affect the cosmos? I have two experts who will be talking about this matter, and the subject will begin in a moment. I am speaking with two experts on dark matter, Glenn Starkman and Priya Natarajan. Uh, as I like to usually do, I'd like to give them a few minutes to just give a little bit of background about themselves and also their takes on dark matter. I will start with Glenn, who's on the left. Uh, Glenn, if you could get a little bit of background about yourself and what you've written about the subject. Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Glenn Starkman. I'm a professor at Case Western Reserve University, where I direct the Center for uh, Education and Research in Cosmology and Astrophysics uh, on the Institute for the Science of Origins. Uh, I've often on done work both on dark matter and on what you might regard as the alternative to dark matter, which is uh, modified uh, modified gravity models that try to uh, reproduce dark matter. Uh, I currently do work on the possibility that dark matter is some form of uh, mac some macroscopic object, not a tiny particle, but a chunk of nuclear matter or a primordial black hole, uh, models like that. Mm -hmm. I've also in the past worked on dark matter, uh, particulate dark matter, both axions and uh, what are kind of sort of interacting massive particles. Yeah. We'll talk about that uh, in a bit. Uh, Priya, uh, if you could give a little bit of background about yourself and anything you've written about dark matter as well. Yeah, so uh, my name is Priya Natarajan. Um, I'm a faculty member in the departments of astronomy and physics at Yale University. Uh, I'm a theoretical astrophysicist, and much of my work in dark matter has involved uh, mapping dark matter uh, using gravitational lensing, which is the bending of light, uh, which offers one of the most powerful ways to actually infer not just the existence of dark matter, but the detailed distribution of dark matter. I have written quite a lot about dark matter. Um, in fact, I've written um, a book last year about radical ideas in cosmology, dark matter is one of them, and much of my work has involved confronting our leading theoretical understanding, which is the theory of cold dark matter, with uh, observational data from gravitational lensing. Yeah. And gravitational lensing is when a, a large object like a, a, a galaxy may have, make a, a, a distant star appear in two places or something that, along those lines. That's right. So uh, the, the scale on which I have looked at a gravitational lensing is basically any matter in the universe would cause distortion and deflection of light rays from distant objects that lie beyond the mass and light en route from, say, a galaxy or a distant star uh, get put it on its way to us and we would end up seeing no longer a single image of the star or a galaxy, often multiple images. And occasionally we would see uh, just a distortion. So you don't see the original shape anymore. You see an elongated shape of an ellipse uh, for a galaxy that might actually be circular. Uh, and so you can use this distorted effects of the background uh, scene of galaxies distorted by the mass in the foreground. And I have looked at some of the largest concentrations of dark matter that would produce the most dramatic effects. So that is clusters of galaxies, which are an agglomeration of about a thousand galaxies and replete with a huge amount of dark matter. So they cause the most dramatic distortions that are visible by, you know, measurable with Hubble Space Telescope. Yeah. Well, let's let me uh, uh, both ask you both. Uh, let's talk to how dark matter came to be hypothesized. Um, from what I, as a layman, know, it, it, it I guess originally was that uh, galaxies, seemingly the outer edges of galaxies, the stars there were rotating uh, far more uh, quickly than uh, or revolving around the center of the galaxy far more quickly than was thought, because just as you go farther out in a fan, the the edge of a fan for example, has to travel faster than the base of a fan. So was that how it first came about? That, right. that Actually, the first, the first proposal for dark matter or dunkel materi, as it was called, was uh, made in 1933, and it was made from clusters of galaxies. So it's the same idea. So galaxies were moving around in a cluster much faster than they would, uh, they would have if the only gravity was that of the visible 
matter that we saw in the stars in those galaxies. And it was Fritz Zwicky, a Swiss astronomer who was at Caltech, who made this, uh, it was empirical, this measurement. And he said the explanation for these uh, fast and expected rapid motions was the possible presence of more gravity than matter that is unseen. And then in 1937, with the same class of objects, clusters of galaxies, he actually predicted that this gravitational lensing phenomenon uh, should reveal this dark matter if it was present. It just so happened that we didn't have the instrumentation that was capable of detecting those small deflections. And you're right that later in the 1970s, the idea of dark matter was rediscovered by Werner Rubin, Ford, and collaborators when they looked at the speeds of stars in galaxies rather than clusters of galaxies. So dark matter was kind of discovered, rediscovered in many different contexts. But I think the most sort of uh, incontrovertible, strongest evidence came from uh, galaxy rotation curves, as you mentioned. That's certainly what, what, what eventually convinced people that there had to be something there. People had kind of um, ignored Zwicky's, you know, Zwicky's work for a long time, um, but it was really when Vera, Vera Rubin and, and her collaborators uh, presented such a convincing case that every galaxy they looked at, the distant parts of the galaxy were rotating uh, much more quickly than they should have if all of the matter was what we could see. Well, uh, wouldn't the first thing that someone would check on would be maybe an error? How do we know that it, there's not some mathematical error or that maybe gravity is non-scalar, i.e. that what works on a planetary or a solar system level may not work on a, a, a galactic or a supercluster level? I mean, that's a great question, and the answer is, um, at some extent, that, that is an ongoing controversy, an ongoing debate. Uh, between, you know, in, in the theoretical, uh, you know, in, in the field, uh, is the explanation for how galaxies and clusters, and not just there, is the ex you know, dark matter plays an important role in the early universe, uh, is the explanation that we are missing some of the matter, that there's stuff that that's there causing gravity that we don't see, or is it that uh, Newton's law of gravity and Einstein's general relativity aren't the full story about gravity and then when we get either to large distance scales or the leading theory when we get to very low accelerations that we have to modify our law of gravity and that there's a, a better theory uh, that there's an improved theory that describes uh, uh, very large objects like galaxies clusters of galaxies um, so yeah an ongoing debate among the between those two explanations yeah, and in fact, uh, that was really the first question that was asked, and it was um, Finzi who asked this question in the 1960s, the very question, um, Dan, that you raised, which is why should we believe that Newton's laws that happen to work both terrestrially and in explaining the solar system, why should they actually be applicable on cosmic scales? Um, and I think, um, as Glenn pointed out, that that question has actually reverberated and continues to reverberate uh, today. And that's what informs many of the alternative proposals to the existence of a partic particulate dark matter uh, that you might have. Or um, dark matter at all. Yeah. Exactly. Dark matter at all. Well, uh, as a layman, I know when I was a kid, uh, I remember seeing the show Cosmos by Carl Sagan, where gravity was explained sort of on a giant pool table where you'd have these heavy billiard balls and gravity was really just a, a, a star would sink farther into the, the tabletop of the cosmic uh, pool table. And so what appeared to be uh, gravity, something pulling, was really just the distortion in space-time. Now, I've heard of things, theoretical particles, called gravitons. Uh, when we talk, uh, from what I've read, dark matter is either thought to be large objects, machos, I think was a term that was uh, around a while back, which would be like uh, brown dwarfs and uh, other stars and whatnot, or subatomic particles, wimps uh, uh, or whatnot, uh, would gravitons be something, if gravity does act uh, or does have particular particulate matter or something that, that causes gravity, uh, a graviton, could that be something that would be a part of dark matter? No. So gravitons, so for example, we, we understand electromagnetism. Uh, we have since the late 1800s. 
Um, and when quantum theory came along, we realized that uh, that uh, electromagnetic that light and other electromagnetic radiation came in units that we call photons, a quanta that we call photons. So the graviton is the hypothetical unit of gravity, but it itself doesn't make particularly good dark matter. Um, you know, dark matter needs to have certain properties. For one thing, we, we need dark matter to move relatively slowly. Uh, you know, we, we need it to, otherwise it will just escape from uh, from galaxies and from clusters of galaxies. So gravitons move at the speed of light, which isn't slowly. So gravitons themselves don't make good dark matter. They're just the carriers of gravity, the hypothetical carriers of gravity, in a way that photons are the, the not a hypothetical, we've measured photons, they're the, they're, they're the carriers of electromagnetic uh, force and, and of electromagnetic radiation. Priya? Yeah, yeah, I, I, mean, yeah um, I just wanted to second that. So graviton, gravitons are just the mediating particle, if at all. So they are not they are not part of our pantheon of uh, potential candidates for dark matter. As far as coming back to the uh, other candidates that you mentioned, like brown dwarfs and dead stars and so on and so forth, we actually have constraints from microlensing experiments uh, looking through the halo of our galaxy to try to chart what function for our halo could be made up of the dark of our halo could be made of these particles and it's a very insignificant amount i think one of the intriguing things about dark matter is the many many independent lines of evidence so for example we have evidence from cosmic microwave background data that it is dark matter that structures the entire universe it's the scaffolding on which all baryonic matter actually collapses and forms galaxies that we see so we have a model in which dark matter structures the universe and we have a lot of independent lines of evidence from the clustering of galaxies from the cosmic microwave background and the uh, the kinds of structures that we see at different epochs in the universe all of that is very consistent with this idea of cold as glenn mentioned very slow moving cold dark matter particles that formed likely at some very very early epoch in the universe well priya let me let me and just let me just use a metaphor because you said that dark matter is the thing that uh, uh, the rest of the universe is structured upon would that be akin to use a metaphor of say a little grain of sand inside an oyster that becomes a pearl that dark matter is somehow at the center where regular matter conglomerates no, no, no. i think no. that's not the right metaphor the metaphor is scaffolding for a building Okay. The fact that you need the scaffolding to actually put the structure up. And so the structure that you're putting up would be galaxies and the matter that we see, the baryons that actually have pressure, that collide with each other, and you know, and have all the properties that we are familiar with. And then dark matter, which is this peculiar form of matter, has a bizarre equation of state, would be the scaffolding scaffolding, the necessary scaffolding on which which provides the kind of cradle, if you wish, for everything else to form. So, in fact, the, the best evidence for dark matter, I would say, I mean, we, we as, as Priya and I talked about, you know, we, we saw dark, we, we um, decided that there must be dark matter or a modification due to, of, of Newton and Einstein's laws by looking at galaxies and clusters. But then people did a lot of work to, to predict that when we looked at the cosmic microwave background, the relic light from the early universe, we should see certain statistical patterns in that that are the remnants of an early epoch when dark matter started to collapse, when over densities of dark matter started to collapse and attract um, ordinary matter and photons. And those would be very distinct ripples, really sound waves, the imprints of sound waves in the, in the microwave background. And so that was predicted a long, long time ago. And, and at this point, we see, um, well, uh, over a dozen feet in the patterns in the statistical properties of the cosmic microwave background that were predicted in advance from the dark matter model. And it's that pattern that is so difficult to reproduce with modified gravity theories. So the success of dark matter in, in many ways is not the observations that we see in galaxies and clusters because that's how we, that's how we came to invent it. It's the predictions for how a structure would form in the early universe and how that would then imprint itself on the cosmic microwave background. Predictions that are very hard to get right with modified gravity theories. That's right, well, because also, um, also the, the predictions that were made and the observational measurements that are made are at extremely high precision. 
that's the other thing. They're at extremely high precision. So it's uh, it's been impossibly hard for an alternative theory to predict them at the level that this theory that uh, has dark matter as the star, you know, uh, actor, the key player um, has predicted. So in fact, most people who look at modified gravity theories now, um, what they do is they, uh, and, and I've done some of this in the past, and, and uh, I know you had hoped to have Stacey McGon. He, he does a lot of observational work on dark on um, dark matter and the possibility of modified gravity theories today. Um, but most people looking to explain, to, to have modified gravity instead of dark matter, actually have some sort of dark matter in the early universe, because that's you need that in order to reproduce the cosmic microwave background, but then explain that the current, that some mysterious properties of galaxies today are caused by the fact that today in galaxies it's not dark matter but modified gravity that is that is causing what you know the behavior of gal galaxies so it's a kind of um, different things at different times right and I just want to add to that um, that you know aside from the gra modified gravity theories or alternative theories finding it very hard to explain what's happening with the early universe the sort of the seeding of structure that we are both talking about that these modified theories also fail to account for cluster cleansing. So, you know, while they may be able to account for the rotation curves on galaxy scales, it's very challenging for them to not invoke yet another constituent uh, to explain uh, clusters of galaxies, which is why I find clusters of galaxies very interesting uh, laboratories for uh, testing dark matter. On the other hand, and uh, let me push back a little bit about that. I, I, I do think I do think that those modified gravity theories, first of all, they do have a natural second uh, you know, extra constituent, which is neutrinos, because our, many of our best limits on neutrinos don't apply in those theories. But but also they do have they do naturally come with uh, with ways in which uh, they might explain clusters. I mean, part of the problem is we've spent, as you mentioned, we started thinking about dark matter in the nineteen thirties. We started thinking seriously about modified gravity theories, you know, in the 1980s, and didn't really get going until the early 2000s. So, you know, part of the theory thing is that maybe the modified gravity theories need more time to to get the predictions right. But it's certainly true that they are not as predictably successful in, in clusters. Um, I think the thing that has brought back attention to modified gravity theories is actually. Uh, the, the behavior of galaxies that seem to have a very certain, very simple relationships where if you know where the ordinary baryonic matter, the stars and the gas and the dust are, you seem to be able to, in, in essence, predict where the dark matter must be um, to a greater extent than we would have thought possible, thought necessary in dark matter models. So that's the struggle of dark matter models, maybe, is to, is to try to explain this very simple relationship between how much matter is and where the, where the stars and gas and dust are that doesn't automatically seem to fall out of dark matter theory. Let me, uh, yeah. let me just uh, turn uh, back to the idea of scaffolding. And I know you didn't, don't mean that in the sense that uh, it was something uh, predetermined, but it sounds like uh, if we're talking about a Big Bang, and let's say that 14 billion years ago that actually happened, and that's the beginning of the cosmos as we know it, <coughs> it would seem that the, the scaffolding would have to have been there very early, which implies a kind of intentionality beyond random chaos of something just exploding, or a multiverse where you might have had our, our cosmos emerge from some larger or be a smaller part of a larger, grander substance, because it would seem to me, just as a layman, that that to have this pre-existing scaffolding would be very difficult, uh, just for something that that randomly pops into existence. And how, when we talk about the scaffolding, was it there? You know, half a second after the Big Bang, a hundred years, a thousand. Right. So first, let me rein you in a little bit, Dan. You're mixing up a lot of different questions here. Okay. So the first is that the idea of the scaffolding basically tells you that you're right, very, very early on in the universe, when particles were created, all the particles that we know were created, these dark matter particles were also created. And they formed the scaffolding because, and as you said, dark matter drives structure formation 
because there are very small fluctuations that are imprinted in an otherwise what would be a uniform field of dark matter. And these small fluctuations, we believe, are imprinted likely very soon after the Big Bang. And how and why exactly they're predicted, we don't know, but we know what the form of those fluctuations, we can back out what the form of those fluctuation needs to be for the entire story of the scaffolding and seeding uh, galaxy formation, etc., to hang on together. So the, we don't even need to go to the, I mean, I don't see why the multiverse has been, that's why I wanted to rein you in a little bit. The multiverse idea has to do with the question of why we have the initial conditions that we do. Okay, so that's a separate question from whether we can actually infer the, in, uh, the initial conditions from what we see today. And I think that's where the dark matter paradigm is so powerful as like that there's a whole slew of observations that we can make today and look back out into the universe, into the past and make, and then build a coherent story that actually helps you start from these initial small fluctuations that get amplified by just gravity and then lead to galaxy formation and so on and so forth. So there's some two different questions that you are um, you're talking about here. Let me add, you know, although we don't know for sure, we, we actually have a, a very uh, good theory of where even where those small fluctuations come from. It's called right. the theory of inflation, right? Which tells us that very soon after the Big Bang, or by very soon we mean tiny fractions of a second after the Big Bang, the universe began expanding uh, at a very at a uh, an accelerating rate more and more quickly, and that was driven by some uh, something we call uh, the inflaton a field that drives inflation, and it's the tiny quantum mechanical fluctuations in that field whose properties we're able to calculate. Um, in any given model of inflation that, that tell us that we should get a pattern of fluctuations exactly what we'd like we see when that infl inflaton gives up its energy and turns into ordinary matter and dark matter and radiation it should leave behind these fluctuations in the dark matter in the ordinary matter in the radiation and those dark matter fluctuations as Priya said that turn into the the seeds, the, they, they, they form the place where ordinary, where gravity will attract the ordinary matter and the radiation to form structure in the future. Um, I was, uh, when I was in science class as a boy, I remember uh, that all matter was just energy in another form and vice versa. Uh, it's neither, you know, it just isn't one or the other. It's neither destroyed nor created. So if there is dark matter, does dark matter... Uh, if it's uh, heated up or something, does that become energy? And if so, would would we have telltale signs of what would be a different type of energy from that energy that would be matter in a different form? So dark matter would well, be... Dark, yeah. oh, see, actually, go ahead. Okay. Let me take a shot first. I can speak later. Okay. okay. I mean, so, so, you know, Einstein taught us a little over 100 years ago that energy, you know, and all sorts of things that we hadn't thought about as energy before have energy. You know, we, a, a energy doesn't just come from things moving, just things existing, they have energy. That's what E equals MC squared says, right? That just by virtue of matter, um, if it's a particle uh, or a collection of particles, uh, and, uh, it will have mass and therefore it has energy. So that's what we mean by it's a different, different form of energy. Um, exactly how you, you know, how that dark matter interacts with itself or with ordinary matter is a matter, it depends, is something we don't know today. We have, we know a lot of ways in which it doesn't interact with ordinary matter or with itself. We know that it interacts through gravity, but we don't know how much dark matter scatters off itself. Because if I have dark matter coming through this room, will it go right through this room? Well, that depends on whether the dark matter is, is, is the weakly interacting massive particles that you talked about before, or whether it's a, a black hole. Right, and the, the leading sort of particle candidates, these weakly interacting massive particles, we believe have peculiar properties. They are collisionless, so they don't right. actually, they pass, they don't bounce off like billiard balls and other uh, things that we're accustomed to. 
and not they are actually, I mean, they, they do very, but very rarely. Very rarely, yeah. But I mean, it's very weakly interacting, very, very right. rarely. And uh, but with the equation of state, you know, just the equation of state, which you're probably familiar from chemistry, that describes the properties of gases, that tells you how much you can push and pull a, a packet of gas, the pressure. That the relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature, you know, PV equals NRT is what you find for normal gases. The equivalent relationship for what we consider to be cold dark matter is P equals zero. So no pressure. So this familiar idea of generating pressure from colliding uh, is something that doesn't work for the leading kinds of ca candidates for dark matter, these the WIMPs, for example. Now, when we talk about dark matter, it should be stated that that's sort of a catch-all term. It's not, I mean, as we've said before, you guys uh, and the scientific community isn't sure ab about exactly what it is. It could be three or seven or, or 12 different types of things that's under a collective banner. What is right now the, the leading candidate for making up the bulk of dark matter? Well, for, okay, so for, for a long time, the answer to that was that uh, it was these things called WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles. Okay, and you might so you know these particles uh, weakly interacting means they very easily go through ordinary matter and they don't scatter off of each other very easily when they hit each other. Um, massive means you know ten to hundreds of times the mass of a proton. Okay? So that was the that was and in many ways still is the leading idea that came largely out of the fact that um, particle physicists had a natural candidate for that particle, uh, something called the lightest supersymmetric particle. Okay, so particle physicists had invented this theory called supersymmetry, and they had good reasons to like this, this theory. Or as a candidate for dark matter. Uh, things are a little bit less clear now because Smart physicists have failed to find supersymmetry. Right? So there was the, a, a, a hope that the Large Hadron Collider in CERN would discover not just the Higgs boson, but would also discover the, the dark matter, the lightest supersymmetric particle. It would discover supersymmetry. So far, that hasn't happened. And, and in many ways, I think that's thrown the field back open. Um, and so there are then other candidates. There are the possibility that it is a particle called the axion. Particle physics is also invented for different reasons that has very, very different properties. It isn't massive. It's it's slow moving for other reasons. There's there's a possibility that it was black holes that were made very early in the history of the universe. Uh, they have to, as Priya said, they can't be uh, they can't be the size of our sun. They can't even be the size of the Earth. But they can be um, up to about uh, ten to the nineteenth grams, about a, a ten billion billion grams in size, and we wouldn't have seen them so well. Um, there's also the possibility that it's not black holes, but chunks of nuclear matter. In other words, imagine a neutron star cut into little bits. Uh, those make per very good dark matter and might have been made when the universe was about a millionth of a second old. So there's a number of different candidates, and then there's all sorts of other candidates that people have thought of. Thought of. Um, and so at the moment, I think there's less than five years ago when I think most of us were convinced that we would find the dark matter at the Large Hadron Collider, if not in our dark matter detectors before. Um, yeah, I, mean, I would say that part of, you know, we've been, uh, the community was very excited about uh, WIMPs for a very long time. And given the fact that after about 20, 30 years of attempting to detect it both directly and indirectly, we've had no success, we were finally, I think, being more open to other candidates. And Glenn, wouldn't you say that there's a resurgence of interest in axions as potential dark matter candidates now, partly because, as you said, either at LHC or direct detection experiments, we've not had much success with trying to find the putative whip. Right. I think that, yes. I think there's been a resurgence in interest in axions and in black holes and in, in strange nuclear matter. I mean, there's been a resurgence in interest in all candidates other than just WIMPs because the compelling reason why they were our leading candidate for 30 years kind of um, is, is is rapidly evaporating. Not that we know that they aren't the dark matter, but we know that there's no longer a good reason to believe that they must be the dark matter. Um. I know that, uh, from what I've read, that uh, gravity of the four 
uh, main cosmic forces is the weakest uh, in terms of acting across uh, all of the cosmos. Um, and I've read, uh, you know, assorted articles in, in journals about uh, some people hypothesizing that the reason gravity is so weak is that if there is a multiverse, it's the only one of the four forces that, that might be spread out. And since gravity seems to have been the 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 force that uh, first led to dark matter, uh, could could it be that uh, what we what what we're thinking of as, as dark matter could be perhaps some property of gravity uh, that we don't know of, whether it's a graviton, whether it's, you know, the billiards on the pool table, or maybe that it is a force that permeates part of a larger multiverse. What exactly do we know about gravity, too? Because even though it's all around us, it seems to me the most mysterious of the four major forces. Well, we understand gravity extremely well on the level of our solar system, yeah. extraordinarily well. You and I probably use it every day in Korea. You know, when we walk around with our with our maps on our on our cell phones, we you know we make use of, of, of properties of, of, of our theory of general relativity. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I think you're. I think you're. Let me again. Let me. It's my turn to rein you in. I don't. I, gravitons. I don't think have anything to do with this. The multiverse. I don't think has anything to do with this. Um, the possibility that our theory of gravity needs to be amended on scales below beyond our solar system is a real possibility and one that people are working very hard to figure out how to put on a solid theoretical framework so that we can actually make predictions that we can test. You know, it's nice to say that's an idea, but then you actually have to have a theory that you have, have equations that you can use those equations to make predictions for the, the observations that Priya is, you know, is making using weak lensing. So, for example, we have observations. You know, there are things we can say that if there is modified gravity out there, that will cause some of, uh, you know, the weak lensing observations to differ from other observations. So there's there's a range of possibilities for observations that can be made to test this, these ideas of that dark matter isn't the story or the, not the complete story, that we also require a modification of gravity. Right, um, right. So, um, yeah. Um, so, yeah. I, I knew already that the Newtonian conception of gravity was inadequate, and Einstein's reconceptualization, radical reconceptualization of gravity with the general theory of relativity, uh, we know um, was a covering theory. But we also know that because Einstein's theory is not has not been integrated with the physics of the small, with quantum mechanics, that we don't have a quantum description of gravity. We don't have a fine-grained description of gravity yet, right? So we know that our theories, in some sense, are incomplete. So there's obviously the possibility of some kind of extension of finding an overarching theory. And as Glenn mentioned, those efforts are ongoing. And I think there's been, um, you know, some recent um, developments in at least how to formulate the problem. We've not solved it yet. So I think that, you know, the, the refinement of our current understanding of gravity is ongoing. And I just want to remind you that, you know, the kinds of tests, again, that we are able to do for these cold dark matter model. So I just have a recent paper out with some really exciting results and we have a press release coming out next year, is not just the deflection of light, but also using the deflection of light, we are now able to make a very uh, high resolution map of the spatial distribution of dark matter inside a cluster. And so this is called substructure, a map of the substructure, which is how dark matter would clump if it was cold dark matter. So the amount of clumping, the degree of clumping, how it clumps spatially depends on the nature of the particle. And the latest data from the deepest Hubble Space Telescope images from these Hubble Frontier fields are extremely consistent with what cold dark matter predicts. With predictions from simulations of cold dark matter where we can mimic our observations and we can actually count the clumps in both these scenarios and they match to six orders of magnitude in mass, which is quite spectacular. So I think that, you know, while we know that we have an incomplete theory, the successes of this cold dark matter are actually very tantalizing. 
Well, let me just ask, since most people watching this will probably be laymen, you've used the term cold dark matter several times, Priya. What is that versus hot, hot dark matter? Because that would be what I would infer, that there is a hot, hot dark matter. And why is, it seems to me from what you're saying, that cold dark matter seems to be the favorite uh, some yeah. there. Cold dark matter is really just a, just a fancy way of saying particles that are moving very slowly uh, most likely sort of the neutralino type particles, WIMPs. So these are moving at velocities that are much, much lower than the velocity of light, of course, uh, which explains why they are held together gravitationally in galaxies and clusters and so on and so forth. Or hot dark matter, on the other hand, would be relativistic particles, particles like neutrinos, which we already know cannot contribute to and comprise all the dark matter we see in the universe. Perhaps they could contribute at some level, but you know, at the moment we are looking uh, sort of, you know, um, for a more sort of Occam's raised simplistic explanation with one kind of dark matter that explains everything that we see. Okay. And these different kinds of particles actually have different unique signatures that are predicted. Hot dark matter was kind of a leading theory, alternative theory back in the 1980s that, that, that you know, that, that over time became less and less compelling compared to cold dark matter. Yeah. Um, I'm looking on the NASA website, and uh, last fall uh, there was a headline that made news. It says, Hubble reveals observable universe contains 10 times more galaxies than previously thought. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, does the under counting of the cosmic census, would that have anything to do with, uh, you know, mass or matter out there? Uh, no, I think uh, the, the undercounting there was by about a factor of three in terms of number of galaxies because there's classes of faint galaxies that were not accessible to us that we might have undercounted. That was a very nice work. But that would not alleviate the dark matter problem because that is still insufficient to account, a factor of three is still insufficient to account for all these observations that Glenn and I have been talking about, the rotation speeds in galaxies, and um, uh, you know, so an overall census being off by a factor of three uh, would not alleviate the dark matter problem. And that was a... Glenn? We both know how many, you know, we're, we're trying to count the galaxies, but we actually know how much ordinary is it meant that we are closer to accounting for all of the ordinary matter that we know is out there? And the reason we know it's out there is because of general relativity and, the, and cold dark matter, we um, are able to explain these patterns of, in the, of, uh, of sound waves in the microwave background in the early universe very precisely. Only if is a certain amount of dark matter and a certain amount of ordinary matter. And and so we know how much ordinary matter there is. And, and so the census gets us, says, okay, now we found most of the ordinary matter, but we still have six times as much, sorry, five times as much dark matter. And we know that ordinary matter does work well instead of dark matter in the early universe. Okay, so um, it's, it's just not, it, it doesn't, work the same way, because unlike uh, the dark matter, which has no pressure, ordinary matter does have, and so behaves in a completely different way. Um, usually observations that are confirmed lead to a different view of something. So how would the pre-dark matter view of the cosmos differ from uh, a dark matter confirmed view of the cosmos? Does that say anything about the the origins of the cosmos, about the end of the cosmos, if there's X amount of dark matter, does that mean it's much more likely that the universe may collapse back in on itself, or things of that nature? Yeah, we have uh, we have far too little matter, ordinary plus dark matter for the universe, for us to expect the universe to collapse in on itself. The universe currently, uh, out of the total energy in the universe, about 5% is ordinary matter, about 25% is dark matter, but 70% is this other stuff whose who's exact identity we don't we call it dark energy. It could be the energy of empty space of the vacuum. Um, uh, and that is that has a very different behavior. It's actually causing, instead of 
dark matter attracts things, right? It, it, it's just addition, it, it's an additional source of ordinary gravity. Dark energy is the source of gravity that causes the universe to expand at an accelerating rate, faster and faster. So it's kind of pushing the universe apart. Something changes drastically in the future, uh, we don't expect the universe to recollapse. We in fact expect everything we see to be pulled further and further apart, faster and faster, so that eventually the only things we see will be it will be the cluster, the, the local group of galaxies that we live in, and maybe the club, the nearest cluster if we we turn out to be bound to it. Right, and so I think that we know already from our current synthesis of the universe that the future is um, a desolate universe from our point of view things are going to be much farther away than they currently are. And I think, you know, just to kind of reiterate Glenn's point, uh, what got dark matter and dark energy, if you will, are actually opposing the way they are, you know, dark matter tends to add to the gravitational uh, force that galaxies experience, whereas uh, dark energy is causing an accelerating expansion. It's a repulsive force that countervails gravity, if you will. Is there a sense that dark matter might have been an inherent property of the cosmos that may have uh, helped force, for example, life uh, on Earth as we know it? Because um, a, a, a lot of no. no. Well, I mean, I think if, if, if you if you know if one predicates that in order to have life in the universe, you need to form a galaxy then yes, the formation of galaxies is facilitated by dark matter, as we just have been talking about this past hour, right? And that without the scaffolding of dark matter, it's unclear how galaxy formation would have proceeded. But for life itself and for organic molecules or whatever, however you want to define um, life, um, I mean, dark matter really has nothing to do with it, except that, you know, it enabled the systems that could eventually harbor life to have formed. Although, even if there weren't galaxies, you know, that just means that life would have had, it would have been harder for life. It would have had to form in places where there weren't galaxies. But, but you know, um, one of the things is we're, we're very good at, at the moment. The whole system that we see, the universe is actually relatively simple. We are pretty much completely at a loss to extract from the simple physics biological molecules. And so we can't predict, we can't predict biology out of physics. Maybe one day we'll be able to, but at this point, getting from you know elementary particle physics to biology is not something that we are, are capable of. So knowing what it takes to get biology and where it would have happened in the universe if we didn't have the galaxies that we see is not something that we're actually capable of knowing. And so then we get into arguments about, oh, yes, we live in galaxies, and we live in a galaxy, therefore life appears in galaxies. But, but you know, we only have one example of, of intelligent life that we know of. That's us. Right. Yeah, and I think also that we have tend to be very anthropocentric in our conception of life, right? Exactly. I mean, the question is, what do you mean by life? If you want to pare it down, if you pare it down to an organic molecule, uh, there's no reason to believe that even if life has evolved in other places in this universe, in uh, even within our own galaxy, in our solar neighborhood even, that it needs to look anything like us. I mean, uh, I think Stephen J. Gold said very nicely that if you turn the tape of evolution backwards, even evolution that we know under the circumstances that we understand on Earth, we're unlikely to have the same outcome. There is sort of randomness built in this whole process of evolution. So, you know, we can't really extrapolate from our anthropocentric views of life and what constitutes life and intelligent life and so on. You know, I, I like to remain open-minded and broad about you know, what we can or cannot and should or should not call as life. Um, the idea that I've read is that when the universe exploded into being uh, in the Big Bang is that there was a slight preponderance of matter versus antimatter, and that's what led to the domination of matter over antimatter. If dark matter is confirmed, would that necessarily mean that there was something like anti-dark matter as well? Would or, you know, or is, is dark matter sort of off to the side, uh, out of that binary? Again, it depends enormously on your model. You know, so the axion is its own dark antiparticle. The neutralino is its, its own antiparticle. So, but there are other models in which the dark matter has a property like um, baryon number, 
which is the thing that counts protons versus antiprotons. Um, we, we, we mostly believe, although we're not sure, that, the, that even the, the baryon number, the, 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 the matter count versus the antimatter count in the universe, emerged dynamically early in the history of the universe. And there are some ideas of what exactly how that happened. We just don't know which one of them is right or if, any, or if we've hit on the right one at all. Thus, this was indeed some initial property of the universe that it just was create. you know, it, it came into being initially with an excess of matter over antimatter. Uh, These are periods in the universe where it's very hard to extract definite information from, right? Um, we're, we're, we're all trying to do that, but it's hard to look back far enough to the period where this would happen. And uh, it's also difficult to do the particle physics experiments that would explore this. Uh, we, we've gotten up to an energy that's about 10,000 times the mass of the proton. And we had been hopeful that this would all be explained at what was called the electroweak energy, around a couple of hundred times the mass of the proton. But, but it appears that, in fact, uh, physics at energies that are billions or trillions of times the mass of the proton uh, may, may play very important roles in deciding how many protons versus antiprotons, how many electrons versus positrons, how much dark matter versus anti-dark matter if there is such a thing. And I think that here is where there's the utility of the multiverse argument, right? Because at the moment, we have been unable to account for all the initial conditions, including the preponderance, slight preponderance of matter over antimatter that then ratcheted on to give us the universe that we see. You know, that is where you get comfort from the idea of the multiverse, that we happen to be one location one particular universe where this possibility has been realized and it's quite likely that um, there are other universes, other bubbles where this may not be the case, right? There may be other possible outcomes. I think that's where the utility of the multiverse view uh, um, stems from. Well, let's uh, end this segment in the final segment. Uh, I'll have you uh, have some final thoughts about dark matter. We'll do that in a moment. I am speaking with Priya Natarajan and Glenn Starkman about dark matter. Uh, before I ask you just uh, what you think is going to come up in the field in the next uh, decade or so, um, I just wanted to ask a final question. And uh, assuming that dark matter is fully confirmed in 50 or 100 years from now, it's sort of locked in. Uh, science always seems to be one of those things that's always chasing its tail. There's always something that comes up. Uh, do you think that dark matter is the final answer to uh, uh, something, or do you think that once it becomes accepted as a part of things, uh, I recently did a show on Thomas Kuhn, uh, that there's going to be something else that's going to come along the horizon that's going to say, well, it wasn't that simple, that dark matter didn't answer everything, and if so, uh, you know, what might be that thing? You know, I mean, uh, this is where, I mean, I'd really like to point out, right, science is by nature and inherently by construction provisional. So our knowledge is the best to date at the current time. So it's hard to predict the course of future science, and it would be quite arrogant of me to predict that, uh, because I think it's inherent to science that we don't know what the open questions. But what we do know is that there will be open questions, and we know that because We've seen the history of the evolution of our understanding about the natural world. That as we get more sophisticated, and maybe we'll have more sophisticated, you know, human cyborg kind of entities who will who will bend even more clever instruments, and will be able to access, you know, uh, uh, regions of space and time that seem inaccessible to us today. I remain open and excited about those possibilities. It's very hard to know, um, you know, what will supplant. And whether our understanding, whether finding the dark matter particle will be actually be enough to say that we really understood it. Um, I, I remain excited and open to the idea that we will never ever have a complete and full understanding. That's the beauty of it. It will keep getting refined and owned. Glenn? Yeah, so I think Priya said it well. I mean, we... You know, finding the dark matter particle is, if, or the nature of the dark matter, or discovering that there is no dark matter and that what we really have is a changed law of gravity, well, is just one of the questions. It's a question that we have today. 
you know, well, having answered that question, we already have other questions. What is the what is the north, the source of the early inflation in the universe? What is what is dark energy? Um, how did the how did the universe come into existence? You know, was there what is the nature of the origin of the universe? So even today, we have lots of questions that we can look you know that look beyond just the existence of dark matter. But discovering dark matter would itself lead us to new questions. Maybe the dark matter is something very simple, like chunks of nuclear matter that may not sound very simple, but maybe it's primordial black holes. How did those primordial black holes get made? What was the process that made them? Uh, you know, I, I think it's unlikely that we will come to the point where we have answered all the questions. And 50 to 100 years from now, some of the questions we're asking today may be the same, but I bet there are questions we haven't even thought of asking that, that, that will be the ones that are most exciting our uh, our academic grandchildren. Right, you know, and I think that, you know, just to remind us, right, it is not even, we don't have to go back too far in history. In 1998 was when we saw evidence, you know, strong evidence for uh, dark energy. So, I mean, before 1998, we weren't really worrying about dark energy. We saw hints that there may be something missing in our understanding of the entire cosmic inventory. But the idea of how it would manifest and how we would see it, we didn't know that before 1998, right? So things are very unpredictable and excitingly so uh, in some sense. What, I guess my final question would be, uh, all science, at least to be considered science, should be falsifiable. That's uh, what most scientists say. I know that there are some uh, sort of theoretical scientists that don't think that, but uh, uh, is there... Uh, what would be like a silver bullet that would make people say, oh, wow, it wasn't dark matter. Maybe it's not modified Newtonian dynamics or something, but 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 something else. It, would, there, would there be one kind of observation that would be uh, something that would, you know, no? Uh, well, so, so the, the statement that it's not, I mean, it's always proved, difficult to prove that something's not there. Yeah. Um, I think we will keep searching for possibilities for dark matter, but if we, if we, if Priya starts the evidence for modified gravity uh, in her weak lensing uh, work, or uh, and and the related uh, uh, work that people are doing, uh, amassing large catalogs of, of of galaxies and clusters of galaxies, so in those we can search for evidence for, for modified gravity. If we if we start to see that the when we make even more precise measurement, uh, the precession of Mars and the Moon, that they are not following the following the law of general relativity, that will be evidence that it's not that that there's something more than just dark matter playing a role in dynamics on this scale of galaxies and clusters of galaxies. So, um, to prove completely uh, unless explanation. Uh, and so, uh, modified gravity theories lack, there is no compelling alternative explanation to, to the dark matter paradigm. And so, people are struggling to create one so that we can compare the two explanations and see which one is actually giving us, you know, is actually giving us a better answer. That's how you end up persuading people that one explanation that has worked, that works really wonderfully in so many ways. Uh, maybe needs to be isn't is at least incomplete, or maybe is wrong. Right, and I think there really is no silver bullet. There isn't a concept of a silver bullet, in my opinion, in science, because we need lots of independent lines of incontrovertible evidence to prove. Or the standard for evidence are pretty high. There is no one silver bullet that will change everything. A silver bullet, I mean, there could be an observation that points to an anomaly that needs an explanation. An anomaly that is real, that is not a limitation of our measurement instruments and our systematic errors and so on and so forth. But um, I, I think that, you know, the, um, there isn't going to be one observation. There have to be many little places where anomalies crop up which are not explicable within the cold dark matter paradigm. And as Glenn mentioned, it's a very sophisticated, mature theory at the moment. And it makes so many predictions. That's why it's been so challenging to find an alternative. Well, I want to thank both Priya and Glenn for their time. I will link to both of their pages below this video, and you can uh, uh, check out more about them and their work. So thank you very much.
Thank you. Thanks, so Dan. Much.